this is, this is, this is. Episode 420. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Mike Herrera. Great to be here. Um, no guests today, just you, your voicemails, your questions, your comments. We're going to have a thing together. So let's do this. By the way, this is the last week of July. Last week of July is coming out the 25th of July, or of July, I think, Monday. So that means next week, next week is August 1st. 1st of August, we new month. But the important part for, for me is it's my wife's birthday on August 2nd. August 2. That's, that's 9 2, wait, 8 2, <laughs> 8 2 22. Her birthday. So I got to figure something out. If you guys have any, any ideas, suggestions, please send them over. Okay. You can follow me, Mike Herrera TD on, on the socials or the podcast is Mike Herrera Podcast on Instagram, Mike Herrera Pod on Twitter. My Career Podcast Facebook group. It's a private Facebook group. Please join us. Let us know what's up. Give me some suggestions. Um, I'm already planning on getting her, you know, a bunch of flowers. I'm going to get her a card. Uh, I've gotten her a few things like random gifts. Um, nothing special, to be honest. So I feel like I need that one, that one thing. So let me know. Call me and leave me a voicemail. 360 830 six 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 zero so voicemails i've been really enjoying these voicemail episodes i hope you guys are too let me know if you hate it i'm kidding um don't let me know if you hate it i don't want to hear the negativity but i really feel like these are these are fun um last week we had cliff diver from tulsa oklahoma hope you guys enjoyed that that's that's another example of like me talking to young bands up and coming bands bands that are are really starting to move the needle. I love I love to hear from them and bands like them. So uh, if you haven't already checked it out, 419 last week. Um, but this week is all about the voicemails, you guys. So let's get right to it. Let's get right to you, to your voicemails. Here we go. Hey, Mike. This is Katie McKnight calling from North Carolina, representing all the uh, female listeners out there. Girl power, and I have a question that I'm dying to ask you. That I I guarantee nobody else has called in to ask you, at least not lately. My question is, what's your favorite flower? Like, are you like a you know like a roses type of guy, or are you more like a daisies or like sunflowers or more like tropicals, or do you just stick to tomatoes? Anyway, I'm dying to know. Thanks. All right. Bye. Katie, what's up? Thanks for calling in, Katie. Uh, this might be my favorite question of all time. What's What kind of flowers of, am I into? Um, I've got some flowers tattooed somewhere. I don't remember where. I think they're up here. But um, I'm kind of a, a black orchid kind of guy. Is that a bad thing? Is that weird? <laughs> um. To be honest, I don't really have a favorite flower. I like um, sunflowers. I like roses. I like daisies. I like um, dandelions. <laughs> and yes, I love tomatoes. I eat them just about every day. I don't know if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's probably, it goes up and down. A new study comes out, tomatoes are bad for you. Don't eat any. And then another study comes out, tomatoes are great for you. Eat them your whole life. So I'm just, uh, just, just going along, smelling the flowers. Katie, you are amazing. Thank you so much for calling. Let's get to the next caller and see uh, see what other kinds of things people want to know. Hey, Mike, what's up? It's William from Lodanster. It's been a couple of years, man, but I'm still, I'm still around. And even though I haven't popped up at the shows or not, you know, it doesn't mean I've forgotten. I get to try to keep up with what you're working on and I'm listening to the podcast, so I'm, I'm deciding to give this message to you on Monday because I remember it's your favorite day of the week. So I'm wishing you a good week, and, and I hope to see you soon, man. I, I I think it's time. So hope this message finds you well, and and uh, see you soon, I hope. Take care, man. Love you. Bye. William, dude, thank you so much for calling in, man. I remember. I remember you. 
Um, William was a, a guy that, you know, he'd come to all our shows. I'm talking late 90s, early 2000s, um, through, you know, before the internet was like a real thing. He would come, he would write us letters, the whole deal. Um, dude, thank you for calling. Yes, I'm glad to hear that you're doing good. Uh, every now and then I do think about you. I got a letter from you a while back and meant to write you back. And I just, of course, I didn't. So now I feel like um, feel like I probably should, but I'm giving you a letter right now, a vocal verbal letter. Um, William, yeah, you know I know you've been through a lot. N not even knowing your your full story, just from the little bit that you would tell me back in the day, just having to take care of your parents, um, take care of your your siblings. Um, pretty sure William wasn't able to go to a lot of our shows the last few years because he's been taking care of his family he he became you know the main guy you know going to he was going to school and then then he was working full-time and, and I'm sure you're still doing your thing man but I appreciate you calling and I love that uh, I love that you you're still following along and and I agree it is time so come on out let's uh let's get you to the next show uh of course Southern California where it's where it's convenient for you but um I'll hit you up my friend I'll hit you up all right, let's get to the next caller. Thank, thanks for calling. I appreciate it, William. Here we go. Hey, Mike. Uh, my name is Sahan. I'm a massive MXPX fan, just like everyone else who listens to the podcast. Um, I have a couple questions for you, and some of these are kind of based on things I've heard you mention in the podcast before. Um, the first thing is, is, in an earlier episode, you mentioned being a fan of seaweed. And I was kind of surprised for a second. I was like, oh, wait. Mike's in the Pacific Northwest, and he's a fan of Pacific Northwest music. And I kind of almost, like, forget that MXPX is a Pacific Northwest band because of, you know, the other things from that area, especially from that time period, were kind of vastly different. And so I was just wondering if you were, like, fans of other stuff in the Pacific Northwest, whether it's things like, you know, I mean, probably Page of the Lions since you were label mates for a little bit, but also things like, you know, Unwound or Elliot Smith or Sunday Day Real Estate. Or even like a little bit later, um, moving to the 2000s, a band like The Exploding Hearts, which I'm assuming you're a fan of. If you're not, that's the band you should definitely listen to because it's definitely up your alley. Um, kind of a follow-up question, too. You mentioned being a fan of Super Drag, which is one of my favorite bands ever. Um, and I was wondering if you're just, you know, into Big Star, who's obviously a big influence on them, um, or Teenage Fan Club, who's kind of like the in-between Big Star and Super Drag kind of thing. Um, and then third question. I have okay. Before you get to the third question, Suhan, thank you for your question. By the way, I love this topic, Seattle bands. And then of course we got big star and teenage fan club. Um, yes, huge fan of seaweed. Um, the first record I pulled this up that I really got into was despised. And this is actually their very first record despised. And, uh, from, oh, sorry, I started playing from there. They put out in night that was 1991 so they were before us they were before mxpx mxpx got together in 92 and that's when their second album came out uh it's called week w-e-a-k this is the cover it's like a, an overhead shot of the drums and that first record despise was amazing uh week i don't even remember i might have missed it and then four came out in 1993 it's called four and that's the record and that was a big breakthrough for seaweed if i'm not if i'm not uh, mistaken kid candy the name of uh probably their most well-known songs Probably not allowed to play that on this, but I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll find out. But uh, that that record, then Span Away came out in 1995. So they were they were prolific. They were writing a lot of songs early to mid 90s, and and then their last album doesn't even have a date on it. It's much oh 1999. Actions and indications. Great album. Great album too. Like all their albums are great. So. I got into seaweed. I got you know saw them live. Tom and I were are big fans. Um, Sunny Day Real Estate, yes. Jeremy Jeremy Enoch, uh, you know, got to know him a little bit uh, through 
kind of the tooth and nail scene. Like he knew a lot of a lot of people that worked with tooth and nail or worked for tooth and nail or you know in bands on tooth and nail. So like we kind of like met met Jeremy through the tooth and nail scene. And um, who else? I mean, you, you mentioned you mentioned uh, you mentioned somebody in there. Who was it? Let me go back. Um, moving to the two thousand. You know, Unwound or Elliot Smith or Sunday Day Real Estate, or even like a little bit later, um, moving to the 2000s, a band like The Exploding Hearts. Which Exploding Hearts. I'm- okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Elliot Smith, yes, huge fan, love him, uh, loved him. Um, Exploding Hearts. Yeah, Tom. Again, mentioned Tom. Tom is really great at finding gems and finding great bands, and he told me about Exploding Hearts years ago. And yeah, they're a great band, and um, I know they're. Something happened with one of their one of their main, well, like their drummer or somebody passed away. So it was like a, a very very tragic uh, situation. But great band, yeah, all those bands. There was so many more. I mean, I, I got into the Fastbacks. Um, huge fan of the Fastbacks. Big fan of Flop, the band Flop. The, I would say that as far as like a Northwest Northwest band that I really wanted to like kind of sound like a little bit was flop flop had that melodic noisy kind of skate punk thing but they were grungy and and i think um i think the singer's name was rusty i could be wrong but i never knew those guys really we played one show with them um at a bumper shoot uh festival show or weekend or whatever but yeah you know a lot of the bands never really they never really went out, as far as I know, I could be wrong on some of them, but I don't really feel like Seaweed got out and toured a lot like MXPX was doing and uh, stayed more local. And, and I could be wrong. Maybe they toured all over the place and I just didn't know. But I never saw them out and about when we were touring. And, 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 and like bands like the Fastbacks never saw them out and about. So we'd always see them at a bar or something in Seattle. And, and um like I said, that they were a little older than us as well. So to, to me, I looked up to them as influences, as something like they were doing cool things. So a lot of great bands, but uh, man, the Fastbacks, you guys got to check that out. Another, what is, let's move on. Let's move. This is going to take a long time because you mentioned Big Star. You mentioned Teenage, uh, Teenage, uh, uh, Teenage Fan Club. Is it, That's what Which it is. I'm assuming you're a fan of if you're not too, because it's, Definitely. A follow-up question too. You mentioned being a fan of Super Drag, which is one of my favorite oh, bands Drag, ever. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you're just, you know, into Big Star, who's obviously a big influence on them, um, or Teenage Fan Club, who's kind of like. So yeah, sorry, this is a mess. I forgot. So Super Drag, huge fan of Super Drag. That's why we picked Jerry Finn to produce the Ever Passing Moment. Um, that and the Smoking Popes album, those two albums, um, Head Trip in Every Key by Super Drag and Smoking Popes, um, Destination Failure. Two amazing sounding records, records that I feel like could could be their best, you know, each respectively those bands' best records. And I don't want to say it, it is it is their best record because I wouldn't want people <laughs> saying that about, you know, our first record or something like that. But um Huge Super Drag fan. John, uh, actually, John Davis, the singer, songwriter, he uh, is a super sweetheart. He's so nice. And to me, he's kind of a rock star. He's a rock star. But getting to know him, getting to hang out with him, he's so normal, so chill, so down to earth, kind of like me, right? And um, he sang on Tumble Down. He sang on a Tumble Down song, and he sang on, and that one's called I'm Still Here. And then he, that's on our first record. And he sang on an MXPX song. Sad, sad song. Yeah, sad, sad song off of Secret Weapon. So he did an amazing job on both of those added harmonies, stacked harmonies, and just went all out. And uh, I was blown away. So a little, uh, little side piece action there on Super Drag. But getting to Big Star and Teenage, uh, Teenage Fan Club, geez. I mean, Big Star, I got into them a little bit, but I really, really love Teenage Fan Club. Like, I, I, it's kind of weird because I haven't really thought about them in so long, but I used to just put their tape on, yes, cassette tape, and just jam, jam their, their, what was it called? It was called like, 
let me look it up. Let me look it up so you guys know. Um, teenage. It always comes with teenage uh, dirt bag. That's not that's not what we're talking about here. The concept, or sorry, bandwagon esque, bandwagon esque is the co- is the name of the album, and it's a pink album with a like a big money bag on the front, just a drawing, and that record, oh, so good, so good. Just just, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's like just getting into the groove. It's rock and roll. It's definitely rock and roll. It's got. And of course, I can't really play the whole thing, but it's noisy, but melodic. You know, so it's not super fast. It kind of comes in, but it's hard and it's noisy. It's like garage band. Before garage rock became all exactly the same, like now garage bands, you know, wow, you know, like the you know, whatever that style. I, I like those songs, like um, Jet is the name of the band I'm thinking of. Like that kind of became big for a while in the early 2000s, and which was cool, but garage band could be a lot of different things. It doesn't just have to be the rock and roll, I don't know, I don't know how, you, I don't know how to differentiate, differentiate this rock and roll to that rock and roll, but I guess I'm talking about like, a really hyped up like ah, that's rock and roll where this teenage fan club record is like she wears denim wherever she goes says she's gonna you know like just like it's about things in their life happening and and, and it feels so real i don't know i maybe i learned to write songs from teenage fan club but great call great bla- blast from the past for me because i haven't really listened to them in so long but Really love them. Um, all right, what what else are you talking about? Because you're not actually done, Suhan. You have more questions or or a more part to the question. Another part. Here we go. The in between big star and super drag kind of thing. Um, and then third question I had is just generally, if you could just talk a little bit more about what it was like to sign to a major label um, after life in general. Um, seems like a really interesting time for music, and obviously tons of bands were getting signed in the early '90s. Um, but by then, I was thinking about it, and there weren't too many, like, you know, melodic punk rock bands on majors at the time, besides, like, Green Day was sort of, like, figuring out what they were going to do. Um, and then you had The Offspring. I'm not sure if Bad Religion was on a major level by then. Um, Unwritten Law was on there, and, you know, Lesson Jake was doing their thing. I guess we won't let them in with them. But, you know, generally speaking, it wasn't like how it was, like, a few years after y'all signed. So if you could just kind of talk a little bit more about what it was like to signed a and at that time and the you know the two records that you that you did for a and sorry three three records you did for a and um or maybe that third one was on an a anyway i'm reaching my time limit here finally someone mentioned um on another episode okay let me just <laughs> i'm gonna pause it again major labels um you know it's funny is there wasn't a ton of bands on major labels punk bands but there were a few which is kind of why we were like Maybe it makes sense to go to a major label. So can I, I'll just say one, the reason why we signed to a major label at that point was because Tooth and Nail could not keep up with the demand for our album. Life in general was out. It was everywhere, but it wasn't everywhere. People wanted the record. They couldn't find it. And so we were like, okay, this is a problem. We need, we need, we need better distribution. And that's ultimately why we started looking towards a major and then of course the whole finding out we were getting ripped off completely and all that you know like you 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 know that whole thing when when we were told you don't really need a lawyer you only need a lawyer if you're going to sell a lot of records we're like well i guess we're not going to sell that many records right what's a lot of records so we took uh brandon's advice didn't get a lawyer and um I'm grateful to be here. I got to say, I am so happy that we did not get a lawyer because it probably would have changed the whole, the whole thing. You know, maybe we wouldn't have never gotten even signed, you know, like, okay, we're not signing that deal. It's terrible. Well, to the nil is like, okay, we'll just get the next sucker. And here's MXPX at the time, magnified plaid, just doing their thing in Bremerton and maybe never get out. So I say that with a grain of salt because 
I realize all these de decisions, some of them bad decisions and poor decisions, non-decisions at some point, but all those things have led us here and brought us here today. So <laughs> a lot of people are going, well, that's not good. I'm not talking about the broad overall arching cultural position that we find ourselves in right now. I'm talking about MXPX, just MXPX and our career and in our trajectory and how, how far we went, how far we've gone. So anyway, that being said, we, we wanted to sign. So we started, we started looking around and we took meetings with Sony, Geffen, A&M, which those are all basically kind of the three. I mean, there's Sony and there's um, Universal and there's uh, the third one is, is, uh, well, I had it in my head. Now it's gone. But basically it's like um, kind of what Geffen was. Um, yeah, I'd have to look up something to, to really tell you. Sorry, everybody. I, I can't think of the, the third the third big branch of government slash major labels. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so you, you get Sony, you get Universal, and you get the third one, which I can't remember. Um, it's like Island or something. Like Island was also part of it or something. But I could be totally wrong. I could be thinking thinking of something else. But we, we took meetings with, with the three majors, and A&M was a major. They were a boutique label owned by Universal. So not not to get you guys confused. So A&M was a major, but it's just a smaller label owned by the majors, right? And we really liked one, Jerry Weintraub, who, who was the guy trying to sign us. He was a and r guy. Great guy. Still, I haven't talked to him in years, but... He's always been a good guy to me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with those vibes. I think he's still a good guy. Um, he did a lot of great things for us. He saw a lot, a lot of um, potential in in what MXPX was doing, and we really, you know, that's how we 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 started the fan uh, the fan uh, what is it called <laughs> fan. Uh, it looks like our fan club, but it was called like Fanscape or something like that. They, they started a company and MXPX was the very first sort of like partner artist that worked with them and kind of got them going. So a lot of history there. Let's get back to the major label thing. Um, what was it like? I mean, we went to Sony. We talked to uh, Don Einer, I think his name was. And at the time he was uh, the president of Sony. And this guy, Tim, I can't remember his last name, Tim, nice, nice guy. He was an a and guy, Tim. He brought, he took us to dinner in LA at, you know, this fancy Chinese place. And we, we ate bok choy. Bok choy is just like a nice uh, piece of lettuce. Like, I don't know. It's, it's good. I like it. Uh, but I just like little details. I remember. So we, he took us finally to New York and we flew to New York first class, by the way, on our way to this meeting, we got struck by lightning. We were in the plane, the plane got hit by lightning. Captain comes on, oh, looks like uh, we're gonna be okay. We got hit by lightning back there, but uh, he told us way after, like he was like waiting until we were fine. That's what everybody kind of does these days. They just wait, assume that everything will be okay as long as you're not dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we arrived, we made it, and we had our meeting, and they took us all around, you know, the Sony building. We, we had lunch in the Sony Club, which is like their exclusive boardroom dining area on top of Manhattan. You're up in the top floor, and you're just overlooking all of Manhattan. It's beautiful. Very fancy. Very, very high-end kind of stuff. And we're like, mm, you know, we're just kids. You know, we don't know what we're doing. But we went back to L.A., had some more meetings, met with Geffen. At the time, they were right on uh, S Sunset Boulevard, I want to say. Sunset Boulevard, um, right, in, right in Hollywood, not too far from, like, where the House of Blues was in Hollywood. So that was kind of cool to go to their offices. But ultimately, between them and A&M, A&M's offices are also in Hollywood. Uh, they were in the old, um, what's now the Jet, the the Jensen, J Jim Henson studio, the Muppets, that used to be A&M Studios 
where we mixed um, we mixed a bunch of things there, but slowly going the way the buffalo was mixed there, and I'm pretty sure the next couple records, a couple of them were mixed there, but um, that's not important right now. Back to A and M getting signed, Larry Weintraub. We go and we he introduces us to the label president at the time, Al Gafar. I think that's his name, Al Gafar. Sounds about right. And this guy was a really cool guy. Really, We really just had a good feeling about Al. Like he seemed to have a good head on his shoulders. He wasn't um, too far out there. You see, Don Einer over at Sony, I think I can say this because nothing actually happened. But <laughs> when we were talking to him, we had a meeting with him. He's like, so this Brandon character... Uh, do do we need do I need to make a phone call? Do I need to take care of this guy? And we're like, oh no no no! I mean, pretty sure we'll be all right. You know, like, <laughs> like if we sign to their label, they're gonna like have him whacked. <laughs> we're okay. All right. Uh, it was a little too much for us. We're like, we don't like the guy, but we don't wish him ill. We're all right. Um, so. Back in Hollywood, we're at A and M, and we're meeting with Al Kafar, and he just has, he has some ideas, he has some vision about our career, and he's like, "We could do this, we could do this. Let's go and, you know, I really would, you know, I'm excited for you guys to make a record with us." And and on top of that, they didn't have, I, they were just like kind of kind of an eclectic label, and they had A and M, or sorry, not they had A and M had face to face signed to their their roster and their their self-titled album had just come out and that album's great if you haven't heard it face to face self self-titled sounds amazing great songs great songwriting um that to me was like okay if face to face is signed to a and m then that's perfect for us you know, they were a band that was uh, signed to Fat Records, so kind of a similar label as Tooth & Nail, an indie punk label. And it just made sense at that point. You know, we're like, okay, this this feels good. Let's let's go with this. And so we signed to A&M because they were a boutique label with huge distribution, huge, you know, deep pockets, all of those things you, you, you want in a major label. So obviously it... Uh, it worked out great for a while, but it, ultimately we we became unhappy with A and M, and a lot a lot of changes happened with A and M that were not the people at A and M's fault. It was more of the broader music business in general was changing a lot, and new people came in, whole new teams came in. Larry Weintraub was gone; he was just at Fanscape doing that. That was his full time thing. He he later ended up managing, I think, taking back Sunday and a bunch of other bands. He, uh, so he's he's still in the music business. I'm I'm sure. I'm pretty sure, in some way. But uh, but he was gone, gone from A and M. And so there we were on our own with a whole new team, whole new A and R person, whole new label president because Al Gafar was also gone. Um. But, you know, it's a learning experience because that kind of happens all throughout life. You know, you have a time with people, a team of people, and, and it's really hard to keep that team together. I mean, it's it's a lot like, you know, when maybe not a lot like, a little like when you're in the Super Bowl and you win the Super Bowl and then the next year your team, not every, it's not the same team. A lot of those people go to other teams, get traded, uh, some retire, whatever it is, but you know, we just, we learned that a lot was going on with that. But overall, you know, I'm, I'm glad for the, the experience. I was talking to Tom Chichilla the other day about, oh, we only spent a million, you know, like no big deal, um, on, on, uh, before everything and after. And <laughs> we probably spent more than a million, to be honest, if you, if you add in marketing and all that, but those were the days of big record budgets. And, it was normal then, you know, it was normal to just keep spending and, um, you know, we had a great experience and, and yeah, sure. If I had that to do again, I might do a few things differently, but overall just having the experience is what that money paid for. And, and I realized that. And so I'm like, okay, let's we'll leave that as is. But if I was doing it now, we'd spend money on 
completely different things and this and that and and probably just buy our own studio I mean, we'd, so many of so many of our album budgets could have just bought us a new studio and we just didn't realize that until we were like thinking about oh all all did that that's another that, that that's another amazing album all put out a record called pummel and i think that was on a&m and if it's not, forgive me, but I, it kind of makes sense because it's like it's the type of record that we loved and we we're like, OK, let's make a record on A&M. Let's do this. Um, it was almost like a punk rock major label, it, it, even though it wasn't. Man, good times. That all record is so good. And I just remember hearing that they bought with their major label deal, they bought a new uh, an SSL console, a mixing console. They basically built a whole studio with their money and, and with their recording budget. And I was just like, oh, we should have done that. Of course, eventually, you know, we, we took, I took some of my savings and, and built a studio, but just thinking like, oh, wow, we could have just used the record label's money, built our own studio, make the record, hand it off, here you go. Man. But, you know, you live and learn. So now I know. And, and uh, that was most of our career is just like seeing somebody do something that worked and going, oh, that, okay, okay, it's okay to do that. All right, okay. Like, it's like almost like we got permission in a way. When, when we all know in punk rock and rock and roll, you shouldn't, you don't need permission. Just go do whatever it is you think to do. Um, if you have a pure heart, it's going to be the right thing. <laughs> so, uh, all right, let's, let's. Let's see what else you, your, your fourth, fourth part of the question, Suhan. Let's see. Um, have you ever heard songs by other artists and be like, wait, that sounds like my song? Um, following up on that, have you ever noticed that the bridge of Sparks Fly by Taylor Swift actually sounds pretty similar to the chorus from Well Adjusted? Um, it might be a cool thing to look into. Um, anyway, thanks so much for taking these questions. It'd be cool if you did a book at some point because you're really good at answering these questions and MXPX is a great story. Um, yeah, so I hope you have a good day, Mike. Thanks for being a great songwriter and just continue doing what you do. Um, have a great day. All right, talk to you soon. All right, bye. Dude, thanks, Juan. All right, so check it. Yes, all the time. Not all the time, but yeah, there's been plenty of times over the years where I've been like, oh, yeah, that sounds like this song. But, you know, the same thing happens with us, too. We were in the studio recording the ever passing moment and it's kind of a, a three part studio. So, um, this, this place had, uh, three studios, studio A, B and C. We were in, we were in the mix room at the time, I think. Man, no, no, no. We were tracking. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter what room we we're in. We we're in one of the rooms and, um, the, the record, or sorry, the, the studio is called Conway Studios, and it was in, it was right off Santa Monica Boulevard, kind of when you're getting into the ghetto, and then it's just like this gated oasis. Once you go through the, the gates, you're in this beautiful, like there's a nice little parking lot, there's palm trees, there's uh, outdoor sitting areas. Anyway, you get the gist. It's a nice little studio complex. Um, but everybody's kind of close, you know, when, you know, we have our dressing rooms in the same building. So you, you have a room here and then like Cheap Trick might have a room here. So Cheap Trick was recording the intro, intro theme music for That 70s Show, the second theme music. So That 70s Show had a song for their theme music. And then they ended up just slightly changing the song and kind of re-recording it. And they got Cheap Trick to do it. And I don't remember the song. I'd have to look it up. It's kind of like it's so long ago. But that's why they were in the studios. They were recording this song. And I remember later on seeing this TV show, That 70s Show, and going, oh, that's the song. That's the song that they recorded. It's the one that plays right at the beginning of, of the show every time. It's the theme song of That 70s Show. So we were tracking piano parts, keyboard parts, for, um, well, a bunch of songs. We just happened to be on Misplaced Memories. And there, on the bridge, it goes, seems like yesterday. I'm probably out of key. Cruising down Chico Way. So 
it's got that shuffle to it. And Rick Nielsen, the guitar player of Cheap Trick, poked his head into the studio when we were tracking that part and started kind of like moving his head to it. He's like, sounds like a crazy version of Southern Girls. And uh, we're like, oh my gosh, like that's a huge compliment. We're like, we only steal from the best. And uh, he's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> So, you know, there's similarities and you hear it, but uh, it's all rock and roll to me, you know. Um, now, on the other hand, if Taylor Swift ripped off my song, maybe I got a little payday coming. I love, I, I wouldn't consider myself a Swifty because I don't really consider myself anything. But if I had to choose a modern um, pop star that I really, really enjoy, I'd say Swift. Yeah, she's great. And um, I'll have to check out that particular song because I don't know that song. Um, I do confess I don't know every single Taylor Swift song, but I know uh, most of the hits. I know most of the hits. So, yeah, that's it. Um, I think I got all of that question. Um, people these days, you know, they'll, they'll get really scientific with, oh, that part goes like this and so does mine like that. It's just... To be honest, like, there's a million songs that kind of sound similar to each other. It's it's really about it's about making it your own. You can you can almost sing the same song differently, and some people won't even recognize it as being the same song um, if you put your own spin on it. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not I'm not worried about it. I'll tell you that. But but yes, I have I have noticed. All right, let's get to at least one more. Um, we've got a bunch of a bunch of uh, voicemails to go, but maybe we won't do them all. But let's do at least one more. All right, here here's another. Hey, Mike, what's up, man? This is Brock in Arizona. We've met a couple of times. I keep offering free legal. You haven't taken me up on that. I'm serious. Offer's always open. You or Tom, reach out, you know, if anything I can help. A uh, couple gear questions. One, with your base, do you run that? is an active or passive pickup. Um, I've had a couple Ernie Ball bases in my life, and the active pickup is the point of uh, hesitation for me and why I keep going back to a more a P-base. Um, <laughs> other, other than Got that, it. my other question is MXPX overdrive pedal. We see them all the time, man. How are we going to make this happen? How are we going to be able to buy these? All right. Talk to you later. All right. All right. Um, thanks for calling in, Brock. Free legal, huh? Yeah, I, I vaguely kind of remember that. Daniel Starrett's been doing our free legal lately, but uh, he might be fired right now. I don't know. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll hire you, Brock. Appreciate it. I mean, what better price is there but free? If we just, maybe you could sue Taylor Swift for me. Yep. Get back to me on that. Get back. Let me know if I have a case. Check out the song. Say, is there similarities? Is this, is she ripping off MXPX here? Come on. Um, <laughs> all right. Let's talk bass. Let's talk bass guitar. Now, my Ernie Ball signature series bass is actually passive. It's not active. Most of the Stingray basses are passive, or sorry, are active, meaning you put a battery into the back and it's louder, it's really loud, it's really stringy. Um, but I think, I don't know, I just, I've always preferred passive as well. And then I think it's because of the style of music that I play, rock and roll, for lack of a better term, rock and roll, punk rock, anything that's like very, very much hard driving, I feel like, Passive. Passive is all you really need. Um, now, nothing wrong with act, with active pickups at all. They sound really good, actually. I mean, that's why they do them, because they sound so good. So, nothing against it. But I'm just used to passive pickups as well as you seem to be. Um, but I go a step further with my signature series bass. I, can act I actually have it just the jack so you plug your your cable into the, the input like that and uh that wire instead of going to the volume and tone knobs it goes you know instead of going to these 
matrix is it goes straight to the pickup and so you have no you have the least amount of wiring as possible it's passive there's no volume there's no tone it sounds great just plugged straight in it's it's super solid super strong and the reason i do that is because i don't need a volume um i never need to turn down i either play harder or i play softer and those are my dynamics and then the reason why i don't like to have a volume knob is because i'd always hit the volume knob and the tone knobs i'd hit them and i just be afraid that they would change you know so it's not really a big deal but over the years i've just gotten really used to having a bass that has no volume knob no tone knob nothing to worry about all my tones come from obviously the bass but come from changing the knobs on the amp and that's how i do it i'm sticking to it and I'm sure there's a few people that hate it and that think it's stupid. And why would I buy a bass with no volume? And it's like, well, then don't. But I love my bass with no volume because I, if you need a mute, I, I, I just mute my tuner pedal and there it's muted. So the bass is definitely for performing, uh, whether in practice, at shows, whatever. Um, it's really a performance bass. It's not as much a, a thing where you're just doing ideas. I mean, you can do whatever you want on it, but not having the volume, it's kind of like gung ho, let's go and play the show. Um, but when I'm, when I'm playing my basses here or wherever, just about every bass I own has no volume and no tone knobs. Uh, they're there, they're dummy knobs. They don't, just don't work. And I've never really never really had i've never had any issue not having a tone knob or or a volume knob let's just put it that way um and passive like back to that a little bit you know ernie ball started making passive bases um a couple years ago in fact so you can get a passive stingray as far as i know and, and it might be a certain line you, you can't you have to be very specific and make sure so if you just order a stingray it'll probably be active but um, they do have a few you can choose from. Um, I love Ernie Ball. I mean, they're just solid, solid instruments. Always have been. Even before I was uh, endorsed by them, I, I, put, um, I put my first bass on Layaway. My first Ernie Ball bass. My, my first bass technically was a PVT-40. And I didn't get it on Layaway, but I got it at a pawn shop. Split it half and half with my mom. She bought half. I bought the other half. And... Then my second bass was an Ernie Ball, Music Man Stingray. And I put that on layaway, saved up for it over the summer, finally got it. And uh, that's probably one of the only few Ernie Ball Stingrays that has the full on, you know, volume, tone knob, all of that works. So kind of cool. Unfortunately, a buddy of mine, um, I don't want to say who, but... <laughs> <laughs> a buddy of mine borrowed that bass from me years ago and then I hadn't talked to him for years and we kind of like started hanging out again and I was like hey you still have my bass and he's like funny story um my roommate stole it <laughs> so I'm like okay what are you gonna do he's like I technically still like know who he is he just doesn't live around here but like I'll try to get it from him but I don't think he'll I don't think he's going to get, I'm like, oh, that's so crazy. Like, all right. I mean, it's not, it's not really, the base is worth what it's worth. It's worth being a base, you know? So I'm not going to, going to cry about it, but I was kind of bummed, you know, just my first Ernie Ball Stingray somewhere being held hostage. That reminds me of Brittany Griner. It's a totally random topic, but Brittany Griner is a, a WNBA player that is stuck being held against her will, being being imprisoned in in Moscow, Russia right now. So anyway, I, we don't need to get into that, but free Britney. I don't like to see anybody, any of my fellow, fellow Americans out there trapped and imprisoned, especially for, for almost nothing, you know. Anyway, all right. That's about it, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning into this uh, episode. This was a good one. Suhan, Suhan, you are a stud. And had some great questions that kind of kept it, kept it going the whole time. Uh, Brock, try to get a hold of you for free legal. I appreciate it. Let me know 
if we have a case with uh, you know who and a um, little Tay Tay action going on. And then, of course, thank you, William. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Let's get back together at some point. I want to see you, buddy. And Katie, Katie, Katie McKnight, go check out her podcast, The Bob and Katie Show. It's really great. You can hear some more from her. All right, that's it. Um, Last but not least, shout out to Bob McKnight. Thanks for editing. Thanks for being part of this podcast situation. I appreciate it, my brother. And until next time, you guys, make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you rate and review it if you do that on iTunes or on Spotify or wherever. Um, If you're not uh, already subscribed to my YouTube channel, which I'm sure you're not because I definitely don't have enough subscriptions. My YouTube is Mike Herrera Video. Um, lately, mostly just podcast stuff, but I do I do put out other videos now and again. So. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you. Have a great week. Enjoy. Enjoy.